Naming ionic compounds, aka the nomenclature of ionic compounds, that's going to be the topic of this lesson. Uh, in fact, the next couple of lessons after this are also going to be uh, regarding nomenclature. The next one will be on naming molecular compounds, and the one after that on naming acids. And so before we get there, we've actually got to talk about how we even identify which of these type of compounds we have, so that we know which naming system is appropriate. And so we're going to identify how you recognize if you've got an ionic compound, a molecular compound, specifically a binary molecular compound, or if you've got either a binary acid or an oxy acid first, and then we'll get into naming and work several examples. This lesson's part of my new general chemistry playlist. I'm releasing these lessons weekly throughout the school year, so if you want to be notified every time I post a new one, subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification. Let's get into this. All right, so we got to talk about types of compounds here for a little bit, and in the last lesson we introduced the periodic table, and uh, we introduced the big division between metals on the left-hand side of the table and then non-metals up here on the right-hand side. Notice there's one exception there as well, is that hydrogen's way over here, but hydrogen is also a non-metal. So just keep that in mind. So, uh, but that's going to be the key to understanding what kind of compounds you got. So if we start with ionic compounds here, so ionic compounds generally you're going to have a metal combined with a non-metal. So you're going to have an element over here, one of these metals, in combination with an element over here, one of the non-metals. And the most famous of all times, so is something like NaCl, which you probably already know the name of is sodium chloride, and that'll become useful when we start learning the names. Now it turns out that in addition to the monatomic ions, you can also involve what are called polyatomic ions, and uh, we'll put those on the board in a little bit, but instead of just having a single type of atom or a single type of element, uh, involved in the ion, you're going to end up with many atoms of different elements, many of them containing uh, oxygen, uh, as part of these polyatomic ions, so polyatom ion. All right, so then we'll move on to molecular compounds, and specifically, again, we're going to talk about binary molecular compounds, and binary molecular compounds are composed of two elements, that's where the binary part comes from, uh, and those two elements are both nonmetals. So it's going to be a nonmetal with a non-metal. And so you're going to have some combination of two different elements from this right-hand side of the periodic table up above that staircase. That's the way that works. And then finally, there's a couple different types of acids. And we'll find out uh, a couple lessons from now that when you're naming something as an acid, you're typically only going to name it as an acid when it's dissolved in water and is aqueous, we say. So and there's two types of these acids. And the first is uh, binary acids, and you'll find out first off that an acid is always going to start with an H in its formula. Uh, and for a binary acid, you're typically going to have just one other element. Now, there is an exception to that that we're just not really going to worry about, uh, but that's usually going to be the case. And so a good example of a binary acid here would be something like HCl. Now, one thing to note here is that HCl is actually a combination of two nonmetals. So notice that hydrogen and chlorine are both nonmetals. And so this is not an ionic compound, and it's a, a mistake that uh, turns out it is a strong acid, which makes a lot of students think it's ionic later on in the course. But right back here, it's two nonmetals. It is not an ionic compound. It is a molecular compound. So, and it turns out you could name it either as a molecular compound or as a binary acid, and it all depends on if it's dissolved in water or not. And if it's dissolved in water, that's when we'll name it as a binary acid. And then we've also got a second type of acid, and that's called our oxy acids or oxo acids, same diff. Uh, and these are going to be acids where the corresponding uh, anion associated with it, and again, it's really not ionic, but there will be these polyatomic ions as part of it, and they're going to have these oxy anions as part of it. And so a good example here would be something like sulfuric acid, H2SO4, where it is the acid, starting with H's, of the sulfate ion. And so this is still molecular, it's still all nonmetals, so we couldn't say it's ionic or anything like this, uh, but in this case we do have hydrogens and then one of the polyatomic anions, those are going to be what your oxy acids or oxo acids either way uh, look like. So now that we've learned how to distinguish between these different types of compounds, we're now going to name ionic compounds, and we're going to start with that most famous example. So, and that most famous example is sodium chloride. And so you already know the name and that's what's beautiful. So let's put that up here. So we're gonna say sodium chloride. And I'll uh, give you my first pet peeve here. If you're writing a lab report, just so you know, this is not a person and it is not a proper noun. So you're not gonna capitalize this unless it comes at the beginning of a sentence. So it's just my personal pet peeve. Uh, but now in terms of naming, so it turns out when you name an ionic compound, you're going to name the cation first, and the anion second. 
So it's always going to go in that order. And what's nice is in the formulas, we always write them in that order as well anyway. So it's cation first, anion second, or if you want to say metal first, then non-metal. I like saying cation and anion, and metals are generally the cation, and non-metals are generally anion. But if I say cation and anion, that also accounts for the fact that we can have polyatomic cations, or polyatomic anions, which are more common, uh, involved as well. So name cation first, anion second. And so in this case, our cation is just plain old sodium. Na is the symbol chemical symbol here for sodium, and so that's what we said first here, we named the cation. So, and then we're going to name the anion, but you name the anion with the I-D-E ending, it turns out. Now it turns out that for sodium chloride, this is as, as, as complex as it gets, but for some of them it's going to be a little more complicated. So we got to talk about some charges on ions here for a second. So turns out these noble gases are special, and they're special because they have the perfect number of electrons. So to be, and it turns out they're just a little more stable. And so it turns out the elements around them want to either gain or lose electrons in an attempt to have the same number of electrons as them. So if we look at like the noble gases here, in this case, neon's got 10 electrons, argon's got 18, krypton's got 36, but fluorine, chlorine, and bromine have 9, 17, and 35 respectively as neutral atoms. And so it turns out, as neutral atoms, that's fine, but as ions, they're like, well, if I'm going to be an ion, I'd like to look like this. And so each of them, as an ion, are going to gain one extra electron and have a negative one charge. And so it turns out for nonmetals, they tend to gain electrons, so as monatomic ions, in an attempt to have the same number of electrons as the, the nearest noble gas. And so for fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, as an ion, they're going to be minus one. So for oxygen, sulfur, selenium, as a monatomic ion, they're going to gain two electrons and therefore be minus two. For nitrogen and phosphorus, as monatomic ions, they're going to gain three electrons and be minus three. Now notice they don't have to be ions. There's nothing that says, you know, that we can talk about, you know, neutral oxygen, O2 gas, or neutral fluorine, F2 gas, their diatomics, or, you know, neutral sulfur and stuff like this. So, but since we're talking about naming ionic compounds, in this particular lesson, we're only going to encounter these as ions. And so now we can kind of predict the charges of these non-metals based on how many electrons they need to gain to look like a noble gas. Now the metals on the other hand, the metals over here are actually going to lose electrons. So if you look at sodium here, sodium's got 11 electrons as a neutral atom, and he's like, well if I'm going to be an ion, the nearest noble gas to me is neon over here with 10 electrons. And he's like, all I got to do is lose one and I look like him. And so neutral sodium says, take one of my electrons and now I will be a sodium ion and have 10 electrons just like neon. So and same thing with the other alkali metals. They can be neutral atoms. There's nothing wrong with that. But as ions, as monatomic ions, they're all going to get a plus one charge and lose one electron to look like the corresponding nearest noble gas. So the alkaline earth metals, comparably as ions, are always going to be plus two. And so what's nice is as ions, we always know so the alkaline metals and the alkaline earth metals charges, which is nice because once we get to these transition metals, and it's not just the transition metals, we also have a few metals under here, under the staircase, but all the rest of the metals besides group one and group two, with only a few exceptions, can take on multiple charges, and that is a problem. And because they can take on multiple charges, we're gonna have to know, know what they are, because what we're gonna find out is that when you've got a proper formula, the charge on the cation, the positive charge on the cation, and the negative charge on the anions, those have to balance out to form a neutral compound, a compound with no overall charge. And so in this case, we still look at sodium, and based on where sodium is located on the periodic table, we can see that, oh yeah, he's plus one. And then we can look at chlorine right here, and we can see based on where he's located, yep, gain one electron, he's negative one. And in a one-to-one -one ratio, we're going to get a compound with no overall charge, and that's the correct formula for an ionic compound, one that has cations and anions but has no overall charge. And so if we look at the next one on your list here, something like this guy here, and we have a problem. So because copper is right here in the middle of the periodic table, and it turns out copper can take on one of a couple of different charges. Now, if you're a seasoned chemist, you'll know all well, copper is usually plus one or plus two as an ion. Well, I don't expect you to know that at this stage of the game. What I do expect you to know, though, is that you can figure it out based on context. So, like if I give you CuCl, you might not know copper, but you do know chloride. So, and chloride right here, based on where he's located on the periodic table, is going to be minus one. And so copper right next to him, if copper to balance this out, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Well, then copper is going to have to be plus one. So, and if you contrast that with something like CuCl2, so in this case, chloride is still minus one. 
but now there's two of them and they're each minus one for a total of negative two. And to balance that out, copper doesn't have to be plus one anymore. Copper is going to have to be plus two. And so in this case, if we named this and didn't take into account there's a little extra rule for these cations that can take on multiple charges, anybody but a group one or two or a couple extra exceptions. So we might just look at both of these and just say, well, this is copper, name the cation, and then name the anion with an ID ending. And we might just say copper chloride. And then we'll do the same thing here and be like, well, this is copper chloride as well. And unfortunately, these are two different compounds. They're obviously similar, but they're two different compounds with two different chemical properties and stuff like that. And we've just given them the same name. And that's not helpful. So if you call me and my brother by exactly the same name and we both respond to it, um, that doesn't really distinguish between us and things of a sort. So we've got to give them a slightly different name. And what we do is we use a Roman numeral. We put a Roman numeral right in parentheses here. So, and then you put the charge of the cation as the Roman numeral. So plus one means a Roman numeral one, whereas plus two here is going to mean a Roman numeral two. So, and again, for the group one and group two metals, because they're always plus one or plus two respectively, because they're always the same charge, you don't actually have to use the Roman numeral. And that's why we didn't use it up here with sodium chloride. So, but it turns out they're not the only ones. It turns out there are a couple of other exceptions here. So it turns out AG here is silver and silver, it turns out as an ion is always plus one. And we now expect you to memorize that. Sorry for the bad news. So cadmium and zinc right here, it turns out as ions, again, not in their neutral state, but as ions, as part of an ionic compound, they're always gonna be plus two. And again, we expect you to memorize that. And then finally, aluminum over here below the staircase is always plus three. And because these always take on just a single charge as part of an ionic compound, now we also look and say, oh, they only take on one charge. Just like the group one metals, the alkali metals only take on one charge and the group two metals only take on one charge plus two. And as a result, then you don't use a Roman numeral for these four either, but just those four. Any other metal that's not group one or group two or one of these four, you're gonna need these Roman numerals to distinguish. Uh, that way we know what we call the oxidation state or charge of that metal cation in that compound. So that's the way that works. Now, one thing to note, there is also a couple of common names here. So you'll find out that most of the transition metals have two primary oxidation states. And uh, the only two we're going to take a look at are copper and iron, it turns out. So when it turns out, common name for this you might use for the lower oxidation state, in this case, plus one, you might use the tomb cuprous. So if you notice, copper doesn't have the chemical symbol CO, it has CU, and that comes from the Latin cupra. And in this case, we add this OUS ending for the lower oxidation state, and we use the IC ending, IC, for the higher oxidation state. And so this one would be cupric chloride. Cool, and it turns out for iron, instead of being plus one or plus two, iron's plus two or plus three, and we have Notice iron also again, notice the FE has nothing to do with iron. And so we use the Latin root here, fer, F-E-R-R. -R, and we have both ferrous chloride, let's say, and ferric chloride for FeCl2 and FeCl3 respectively. And so uh, most students aren't gonna be presented with these common names in such fashion. I just quickly interject it for those of you that are, but if you are introduced to these lovely common names, then you'd have to remember that cuprus is for copper plus one and cupric is for copper plus two, whereas ferrous is for iron plus two and ferric is for iron plus three. So that's the one case where you would have to actually know those particular ion charges. All right, let's do a couple more of these. So now we're gonna get into some polyatomic ions. And this is one of the harder ionic compounds to identify because normally we say, oh, ionic compounds, metal and non-metal. Well, these are all non-metals. And the biggest mistake students make is they'll identify that as a molecular compound, but nope, it actually is an ionic compound. It turns out that the ammonium ion here, let's 
is one of our polyatomic ions. And for the polyatomic ions, and I'll put a list up on the board, and they're on the study guide here as well. So, but I'll put it up on your screen, I should say, not on the board. But those polyatomic ions, you have to memorize them. And you need to memorize their name, their formula, and their charge. They're all super important. And so in this case, it turns out NH4 plus is ammonium. And it's always plus one. And then bromine is just a monatomic ion, so we'd name it just like normal with rule number two, and we'd name it with an IDE ending, and so we'd say bromide. All right, we've got one more here, and here we've got copper as the cation. We'd name him first. And just like normal, we've got to put a parenthesis there and get prepared to put a Roman numeral there. And then it turns out that SO4 is sulfate. Whereas had it been SO3, that would have been sulfite. So right off that list. And again, you need to memorize every polyatomic ion on that list. That's the bad news. Now in this case, notice you don't know if this is copper plus one or plus two. In fact, if you didn't know copper was plus one or plus two, you just wouldn't even know what even the options were. You'd have to know that the sulfate ion has a negative two charge. And because it has an overall negative two charge and there's one of them, that means copper here is gonna have to, to balance out, have an overall plus two charge. And that's why we're gonna put a Roman numeral two in parentheses. Now notice in all these examples, we've started with a formula and then given a name, but you might have to work this backwards. So if I say sodium chloride, you can't just write NaCl without factoring in the charges. You'd have to look and be like, okay, based on where sodium is, he's plus one. Based on where chloride is, he's minus one. And that's perfectly balanced, one of each. And so it's just a one-to-one -one ratio in NaCl. Had I said something like magnesium chloride, you would have looked at magnesium right here and said, oh, he's an alkaline earth. He's actually plus two to look like a noble gas. Whereas chloride again is minus one. And so it, it can't be one-to-one -one because I'll have more pluses than minuses since magnesium's plus two. And so what we'd find out for magnesium chloride, you'd end up with MgCl2 to balance. And again, each of those chlorides is minus one each and magnesium is plus two, but since you have two of these chlorides, that's a total of minus two, even though they're minus one each, to get a neutral compound. And so that's kind of the idea. So again, we started with formulas, went to names. You might have to do this the other way around and start with names and go back to formulas as well. But we've pretty much done a pretty good uh, set of examples here, good represent representation of examples for naming ionic compounds. And again, in the next lesson, we're gonna name molecular compounds and there's a different set of rules and that's what makes this confusing. And then we're gonna, in the following lesson, name both binary acids and oxy acids. And each of those has their own set of rules. And so it's not just about how difficult it is to name these things, but you also gotta identify which type of compound you have so you know which set of rules to even follow. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, a like and a share ensures that YouTube shares this with other students as well. If you've got questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. Uh, I've also got this lesson and the entire playlist embedded on my website, absolutely free, and include a lot of the stuff from the study guide, including like the rules for naming ionic compounds. There as well, I'll leave a link in the description. I also have a general chemistry master course, uh, which includes not only the videos and study guides, but also 1200 plus practice questions, final exam rapid review, chapter tests, practice final exams, uh, all part of that master course. I'll leave a link for that in the description below as well. A free trial is available. Happy studying.